Hi and welcome back. In this video, I want to talk through some things about compositions of inverse functions. So I'm going to state the conclusion first, and then we'll talk through it. So if f is a one-to-one -one function that has an inverse function, f inverse, then we can say the following. f inverse composed with f of x, which is the same as doing f inverse of f of x, this is going to be equal to x. So when we compose an inverse function with a function, we just get the same thing we started with back out. Then we can swap the order. So this also means that f composed with f inverse of x, which is the same as saying f of f inverse of x, is equal to x. Okay, so I feel like on their own, these statements are a little confusing. So let me just write you what this typically looks like in practice. So what this would mean is that if I had everything working out the right way and I could evaluate f inverse of f of six, this would always just give me six out as a solution. So doing the inverse composed with the function basically just undoes everything and we get back where we started. So if six is the input, we get six as our solution. This would work for any value. So f inverse of f of anything will just be whatever the input was to begin with. Similarly, we can swap the order. So if we have f of f inverse of three, this is just going to be three. So when we have f and its function and we compose them, we're always gonna get back out where we started. So f of f inverse of anything is just that thing. So this is convenient if you're answering very simple questions, maybe using a table or a graph, where you need to find f composed with f inverse or f inverse composed with f, you can just know that the value remains unchanged. But another application of this is if we're trying to confirm that two functions are in fact inverses of each other. So let me show you what this looks like. Let's confirm that f of x equals 1 7th x plus 4 has the inverse function f inverse of x equals 7x minus 28. So what we're wanting to do is to confirm that these two are in fact the correct definitions of the function and its inverse. So we're going to compute f inverse of f of x and f composed with f inverse of x and make sure that we're getting x as the solution. So I'll start with f inverse composed with f of x. Okay, we got this. So the input is the function f, and so I'm going to replace it with what we've been told the function is. We've been told it's 1 7th x plus 4. So this expression is going to become the input to the inverse function. So rather than just having some x or y value, we have this entire expression. So this is going to replace x as the input of f inverse. So f inverse is 7x minus 28. We're going to take the x and replace it with 1 7th x plus 4. So I've taken my function f it's becoming the new input to f inverse. And now we're just going to simplify. So I have seven times 1 7th x plus four, all minus 28. And I wanna simplify this to make sure I get x as my solution. So I'll distribute that seven on the outside. This means I have seven times 1 7th x plus seven times four minus 28. So seven times 1 7th is x. Then we have plus 28 minus 28. So those 28s cancel and I'm just left with x. So we composed f inverse with f, we did this algebra, and we just got x as our answer. So this is half of our work to confirm that these functions are in fact inverses. So then we repeat this process going the opposite direction. So now we do f composed with f inverse of x. So here, this is f of f inverse of x, so f inverse of x is the input to f. Okay, so hold on, we got this. We take 7x minus 28, that's f inverse, and this becomes the new input to my function f. So what f does is it does 1 7th times the input x plus four. But here, instead of x as the input, we have 7x minus 28. So we're doing 1 7th times 7x minus 28 plus four and we want to simplify this to see if we get x as our solution. So I'm going to simplify by distributing that 1 7th. So I'm getting 1 7th times 7x 
minus 1 7th times 28 plus 4. So the 1 7th and the 7 become 1, and then 1 7th times 28 is 4. So I have x minus 4 plus 4, which is just x. So here, because we were able to do the composition both ways and get x as the simplified solution, then these two functions are inverses of each other, and we would say that yes, 7x minus 28 is the inverse of 1 7th x plus 4. And we know this because we checked the composition in both directions. So let's repeat this with one more example. Let's confirm that the inverse of g of x equals x squared is g inverse of x equals square root of x. And assume we're doing everything on the appropriate domain. You'll see in the next video in this series that we need to do a little bit of work with the domains, but let's not worry about it too much here. We just want to use this composition property to show that square root of x is the inverse of x squared. So what we're going to do is find both compositions. So we'll do g composed with g inverse of x and g inverse composed with g of x. So first, let's do g composed with g inverse. So this is g of g inverse of x. And so g inverse of x is my input that I'm starting with. So g inverse of x we're saying is the square root of x. So I'm looking at g of the square root of x. And what's happening here is we're taking that square root of x as the new input for the function g. So the function g takes the input and squares it, but here our input is square root of x. So we're doing the square root of x squared. Now we just wanna simplify. So at this point you might already know that the square root of x squared is x, but I'll write out a couple other steps. So the square root of x can be written as x to the one half power, and then x to the one half power squared means we multiply those exponents. So it's x to the one half times two, and one half times two is just one. So x to the one power is x, and so x is our solution here. So like I said, you might just already know that the square root of x squared is just x, so those things undo each other but this is a little bit of how you might write it out with exponents. Okay, let's repeat this again. So now we do g inverse of g of x. Here, g of x is x squared. And so this is going to become my input for the inverse function. So the inverse is the square root of x, but instead of x, we're gonna use x squared as our input. So we take the square root of x squared. Now, you might already be confident that the square root of x squared is just x. That's fine. Again, let me show you how we do this with exponents in case it's helpful. So we have x squared, and then when we take the square root of it, that's the same as raising it to the one half power. So I have x squared to the one half power. When I take a power to a power, I can multiply those exponents. So I have x to the power of two times one half, and two times one half is just one. So x to the 1 is x, and we're back at x. So by doing the composition both ways, we see that the square root of x is in fact the inverse of x squared. And remember, this is assuming we're on the appropriate domain, which we'll see a little bit more of in the next video. So, okay, that's just a little bit about how you can use this property of inverses to confirm that a function is in fact the inverse of another one. That's it for this one. Thanks so much for watching, and I will talk to you in the next one.